Hello, fam. Welcome to the Translash Podcast. I'm Amara Jones, and we have an out-of-this-world show for you today. You have to listen to find out what it is. If you're just tuning in, the Translash Podcast is a politics and culture show with a trans perspective, and that means this week we're talking about the first presidential debate. Oh, boy. Joining me to help talk about that and to process all that the debate means is the brilliant Jamila King, who hosts the Mother Jones podcast. We have a roadmap that's been set up for us already by generations of people who have fought battles that are much more difficult, much more personal, much more deadly even than this one. And it's our responsibility to follow it. Plus, I get super nerdy and all the way sci-fi with Ian Alexander, a groundbreaking trans actor who's helping Star Trek go where even it has not gone before. I can't wait to see this future where we've all sort of transcended and ascended gender. Before we dive in, I want to start off with a moment of trans joy. One thing that always brings me joy is trans people getting what we need to feel at home in our bodies. That's why I'm shining the spotlight on Point of Pride's binder exchange program. They've given nearly 9,000 binders to trans people who need them since 2014. Tyler Rodriguez runs the binder exchange program. He says they've sent binders to people in all 50 states and more than 60 countries. Sometimes I get emails from folks who have gotten their binder and they're just so excited. And I, I, I just find myself laughing at their email. And, you know, it's got 18 typos because they were so excited they couldn't even see the keyboard properly. My personal favorites are always every once in a while I'll get a parent. And, I, you know, you get the subject line, you get the preview of the email and you always see my child got their binder from you. And I always cringe a little bit. And then. Almost every time I open one, it's like, I can't believe how different they are. You know, I can't believe how happy they are now. And, you know, as as someone whose family was not always supportive of my transition, knowing that there are supportive parents out there is just makes my day every time. (laughs) Tyler, thank you so much for the important work you're doing with Point of Pride. You are trans joy. Now we're turning to the news. And of course, that means delving in to this week's presidential debate. It was a hot mess. Uh, Helping us untangle and process what happened is the one, the only Jamila King, a race and justice reporter at Mother Jones, who is always bringing sharp, thoughtful insights to everything. We are recording this conversation the morning after Tuesday's debate. Jamila also hosts the Mother Jones podcast and is my former colleague at Color Lines. Um, and Jamila's dream job, of course, is to run an upstate animal farm. Hey, Jamila, <laughs> how are you? Hi, Amara. That is your dream job, right? It is. Def- I don't dream of labor, but it is my dream life. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Running an animal farm. We'll <laughs> exactly. Say that. Living amongst animals is my, my dream. Well, thank you so much for joining me to unpack, as we said, what happened last night. Um, I want to just go through some key moments that stood out for for me and to get your insights about them and to have a conversation about those. I wanted to just start out to frame this, that Donald Trump did not show up to debate. Donald Trump showed up to burn down. That essentially, during the debate, he played the role as arsonist. I don't see how anyone could have done better than than Joe Biden um, during the debate. And... Of course, part of being an arsonist is to just burn facts left and right. But the first moment that I wanted to talk to you about that I think is a really important thing to know and a turning point in the debate that continues to reverberate is Donald Trump's refusal to disavow white supremacists and his encouragement of them, specifically the group Proud Boys. So let's just listen to that sound. But are you willing tonight 
to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not add to the violence in a number of these cities, as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland. Sure, Are you I'm prepared to, to do specifically that, do it? Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what, what, you you what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and right boys. Who would you like me to condemn? White supremacists and right boys. Proud boys, stand back and stand by. So, Jamila, I um, am wondering what struck you about that moment when he was given that opportunity, told, encouraged, prodded by Chris Wallace and did the opposite. So, Omar, I think that this debate, I don't think I know that this debate went exactly as planned. Trump acted exactly how he's acted over the past four years. Uh, But beyond that, he's acted the way he's acted for the better part of 40 years, which has been about the amount of time that he's been in public life. The Proud Boys moment was so fascinating to me because that was probably the truest thing that he said on that debate stage. I think that to his base, which are people who are deeply invested in white supremacy, they are ecstatic this morning. They saw a Donald Trump who was defiant, who didn't care about norms. I think that even though (laughs) The economy is probably the worst it's been in many people's lifetimes. And we're dealing with this unprecedented virus. They are deeply invested in a president and a figure and a savior who is reflecting back their commitment to white supremacy. Yeah, I think that that's right. And I think you and I have spoken about and I've gotten a lot of insights um, on this from you and your interest in uh, cult leaders. (laughs) Um, And a part of being a cult leader is creating an alternative reality, creating your um, self as the proponent of that alternative reality in which the adherents will have everything better. You name it, just fill in the blank. And thirdly, that there being an army literally of adherents within that, right? There's always muscle within a cult movement, interestingly enough. It doesn't only work on belief, it also works slightly on fear. And I think that one of the things that was important was for me, it was that moment, right, of appealing to the army within the group of adherents, specifically the Proud Boys, um, and how it's a necessary part of having and being in a cult. And his racism is the belief system that holds the cult together, I think. So Omar, I think it's it's really fascinating. I don't even think I've thought about this, uh, to think about Trump as a sort of cult figure. One thing that I've learned in my reporting on uh, cults is that leaders come through in great moments of uncertainty. And what differentiates a cult leader from a regular leader, right, is the just adherence to false ideologies that are proven to be false and you really don't have any mechanisms of accountability. You know, I think that this is a moment where we have so many people who are struggling, so many people who are searching for answers, so many people who are afraid and they want to go to something familiar. Joe Biden, it was impossible for him to actually provide a counter to Trump in any meaningful way. But, you know, Joe Biden isn't that that figure who I think we as as people who are struggling in this moment can go to and say, okay, th- I trust that this person will lead me through. Um, I think there's a case to be made that, you know, Donald Trump came across as a stronger leader than Joe Biden, um, if only because he, you know, was willing to yell and scream and, like you said, just be an arsonist and set everything aflame despite anything else that was on the table. Yeah, I think. To that point, I take what Joe Biden was doing slightly different last night. I think that he was trying to do what Joe Biden does, which is to connect with people individually and to show empathy. So why don't we just turn to that for a moment and listen to Joe Biden speaking directly to people and connecting empathetically? Look, you folks at home, how many of you got up this morning and had an empty chair at the kitchen table because someone died of COVID? And so in that moment, I think, you know, he was trying to 
talk to people who had lost, right? And the emblematic idea of someone not being at the breakfast table is this idea of, I understand what it means to lose. Mm -hmm. So I think that he does focus on empathy. And so I don't think that he was trying to offer sweeping ideology. What I do think that he was trying to do was to connect with people and to show that he understood what they were going through and as a result was a solution to that. Right. But your challenge is that you think that we need something bigger than that. Well, you know, I think that first, if you went into this debate undecided, you... <laughs> you know, like I, I don't know what to tell you. You you were not reassured in any meaningful way. I think yeah, anyone who pipe. watched this Right, exactly. Like <laughs> anyone who watched this debate, the takeaway is exactly what you thought it was gonna be before you turned on your TV. The moment that stood out to me actually, Mara, was when Donald Trump kept trying to hammer him on his son. And I resent Are you talking about Hunter? Hell. Are you talking about I'm Hunter? talking about my son, Bo Biden. You're talking I don't about know. I don't know, Bo. I know Hunter. Yeah, Hunter, you know got Bo. Thrown, Hunter got thrown out of the military. He was thrown out, dishonorably discharged. That's not true. It wasn't dishonorably. cocaine use. And he didn't have a job until you became vice president. Once you None became of that vice president, true. he made a fortune in Ukraine, in China, in Moscow. That is simply and various not other places. true. He my made son, a fortune. Gentlemen, my son. And he didn't have a job. My son, like a lot of people, like a lot of people we know at home, had a drug problem. He's overtaken it. He's, he's, he's fixed it. He's worked on it. And I'm proud of him. Trump tried the empathy card. He tried to say, you know, shutting down the government has led to so much alcoholism and depression and you look at the drug use. But I think Joe Biden really nailed it when he defended his son, Hunter Biden, and said, yes, like many people, my son struggles with addiction and he's sort of come out on the other side of it right now. But I think that's a story that a lot of people can relate to. And I thought, you know, that's maybe something that is a little bit more resonant to people in sort of rural Pennsylvania or Ohio who are kind of in the throes to white people in rural Pennsylvania and Ohio who are seeing jobs disappear, um, have seen those jobs disappear and are struggling with, you know, the meth epidemic. So I do think that there were moments of deep compassion from Joe Biden, which was great and useful, right? Like, I think that's ultimately what we would like to see in a Joe Biden presidency is not necessarily him being Obama-esque and charting a path to change, but it's him showing enough compassion and kind of knowing when to step out of the way. I think that's a really important point because after the debate last night, because I couldn't sleep, <laughs> I actually did the Donald Trump test. He looks at people with the sound off and then he makes a determination around whether or not they look qualified enough for a job or whether or not they look like they're succeeding or not. And he makes hiring decisions based upon that. <laughs> And so I did the Donald Trump test. And I think that at the beginning, you're right. He did look strong and Joe Biden looked weak. I probably looked at it for 25 minutes with the sound off. Um, and then probably 15 minutes in, the body language changes. Hmm. Joe Biden starts to look certain mm -hmm. and Donald Trump looks like he's crazy because he's right. starting to go on these long rants. And Joe Biden is just standing there either shaking his head or looking at the camera. And he actually looks like the one that's in control. And Trump looks like he's the one that's coming unhinged. Hmm. And that crescendoed in that Proud Boys moment, I think. Hmm. That was the maximum moment of him literally not thinking about what he was saying and just right. going there, going where he really wants to go. Right. To that point, I saw Frank Luntz, who's this Republican pollster, who's always on Fox, he always has a group of, quote, undecided voters. And he had them on last night. And one person called Ruth is gaining um, fame on Twitter this morning because apparently she went into the debate undecided. Again, I don't, I don't know <laughs> how. And what she said was that Trump sounded like a crackhead and that there's no way she's going to vote for him. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Look, I, I, that's a really interesting point. It reminds me, I was actually um, texting a few folks last night during the debate, and I have a friend who is sort of a political insider who made that exact point that you just made, Amara, that especially earlier in the debate when it kind of felt like Trump was definitely baiting Biden into saying something awful, that Joe Biden was giving off the appearance of a leader. Like he was looking into the camera, 
a lot more than Trump. But I think the thing that's going to be really difficult is like, how do you make Donald Trump look any more incompetent than he's already looked over the past four years? (laughs) Right. Like, what else can we do? There's not a lot left. Right. Like he is someone who is willing to just lie and he says things. I mean, he was even called out for, you know, when Joe Biden referenced the fact that he told people to inject themselves with bleach. And he was like, oh, I was just clearly I was being sarcastic. And he wasn't. So, again, I think it goes back to this idea that people who are supporting Donald Trump are deeply invested in white supremacy. They care about him as a symbol to show that they are important, that they are still relevant, that they are still the majority. And, you know, I I, I just really, truly hope that this is an inspiration for folks who have the ability to vote to just go out and vote. You know, my colleague Ari Berman, who covers voting rights, is constantly saying that the election is not on November 3rd. The election is happening right now. I just got my absentee ballot in the mail from New York. Like, the, the election has been happening for weeks. And I really, really hope that all of these moments of frustration, that people are able to look at them and, and use them as motivation to get to the polls. Yeah, I think that, that you're right. Over a million people had casted their ballot by September 27th. So the election is happening. And I think that fundamentally, that last night did not change the dynamics of the race. Right. Um, on this particular point of possible losing, right, we don't know what can happen. Um, there can be a lot of things that happen at the last minute that shift the dynamics of this race. And we do end up with Donald Trump as the clear winner within five weeks. So who knows? Um, and we should say that because no one does really know. Right. But we do know that there's a strong probability, at least today, that he will not win. And one of the most important other standout moments um, of last night's discussion and where I think we'll sort of land the plane on today's discussion is his lack of commitment mm. to both free and fair elections and to respecting the results of an election. Here's what he had to say about that. I am urging my people. I hope it's going to be a fair election. If it's a fair You're election, what? I am 100 percent on board. But if I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't go along with that. And I'll tell and what, you what, what does that from mean, a common sense, does that mean I'll tell you what it means. To it means screen? you have a fraudulent election. You're and sending you out 80 do? million ballots. They're not, they're not equipped. To, these people aren't equipped to handle it. Number one. Number two, okay. they cheat. Jamila, I don't know about for you, but that was a really shocking moment for me because one of the things that he did do in that, and this is because he's an arsonist, is that in torching the electoral system, he also didn't realize that he's also setting himself up to be delegitimized, Mm -hmm. right? If the results are close in three states and it's because of some voter suppression stuff, Joe Biden's going to have an argument. And ultimately, this is going to the court of public opinion. Ultimately, the House of Representatives will have a say in what happens because they have to certify the election. And so it's weird. He thought that he was undermining Joe Biden, but he may be undermining himself. What struck you about it? It was actually something that Trump said where he talked about his Supreme Court nominee and he was bragging about how he could have three. But he also mentioned that he'd appointed more than 100 federal judges to the bench. That's right. And that is terrifying. To me, that's the long game. He has changed the landscape. No matter what he does or how he does in November, if he wins or if he loses, if he accepts the defeat or not, the damage that he's done in his four years is going to last for generations. It's really important um, for folks who feel threatened by that damage, whose lives have been imperiled by that damage. It's really important for um, us as movements, as people who are ostensibly on the margins of society, um, to start thinking long term, too. Just to think beyond Election Day, to think beyond this awful year, to think even beyond the next decade and think about the type of world that we want to build. Because if there's anything that Republicans have taught us, it's that you have to think about the long game. You just have to. I think that's right. And I think that for me, this um, impulse on the part of people who have been historically marginalized and progressives to a lot of times throw 
um, our hands up at the process and be like, well, we don't want to participate. This is just bad. Everybody is bad. Doesn't do what you just said. We have to look at what party politics and the machines and the levers of power that are available to us and figure out how to use them to advance what we want. Exactly. It's taken Republicans almost 50 years to do to the Supreme Court what they want to do to be on the cusp of ushering in all the changes that they want in society. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, most of the views of the people that they have put on the Supreme Court were the fringe views within their own party. But they worked really hard, this minority, to ultimately take over the Republican Party, and they're on the verge of taking over the country in terms of its legal structure and what's even possible. Right. We have to think about it in the same way, right? right? We don't have the luxury of not playing the long game. Right. And I'll just say, you know, to that point of thinking about the long game, there are folks amongst us who have been doing that. You know, I think about Sylvia Rivera in the Gay Pride Parade um, in 1973 in New York City. And, you know, she's on stage screaming at people to recognize the validity and the humanity of trans women. And she's being booed by you know, gay and lesbian people in the crowd. Like that was more than 40 years ago. So, you know, I think there are models in our community. um, And I think there are people who have been sort of challenging the idea that um, we cannot think long term. I think we have to really think about the world that we want to see and think about what is that world going to look like in 50 years? And what do we have to do right now to make that world possible? I think that's exactly right. And lastly, I just wanted to make the point that all the things that we're talking about right now together form the basis for white supremacy, right? Um, And which is why Donald Trump is a white supremacist candidate. (laughs) We know that there is a strong relationship between white supremacy and patriarchy, specifically misogyny and rooted in that are issues that you just touched upon in gender identity and gender overall. And so I think one of the things that we just have in a nutshell from this entire experience last night is the demonstration, as you said, of who Donald Trump really is Mm -hmm. and what the last four years have been about and why those of us who want a better world have to think totally differently. Yeah, absolutely. I'll say, Amar, it's it's so hard these days to be hopeful. Um, Mm -hmm. Most days I am (laughs) not hopeful. It's a struggle to get out of bed. But, you know, I was thinking last night, the thought that kept entering my mind was as a Black person in America, I don't have the luxury of apathy or resignation because I'm thinking, folks always talk about like, you are your ancestors' wildest dreams or whatever. I'm thinking about, you know, if I were to go back and talk to my grandmother you know, who passed away or my great grandmother about what they lived through, they would just look at me and be like, honey, what, (laughs) this is it? So I I just feel like, you know, we have a roadmap that's been set up for us already by generations of people who have fought battles that are much more difficult, much more personal, much more deadly even than this one. And it's our responsibility to follow it. It's our responsibility to learn the lessons of folks who come before us and to um, try to build that world that we want to see. And so that's that's kind of where I land on a lot of this is like I don't have the luxury of apathy. It may be hard to get out of bed. It may be like really depressing to wake up every day in Trump's America. But, you know, it was way more depressing to wake up in Woodrow Wilson's America. (laughs) You know, so we need to really keep that historical context in mind. I think that's. A perfect, perfect, perfect bow on our conversation. And I think that you're exactly right. I think all the time about how my worst days are better than many of my ancestors' best days. Mm -hmm. And this idea that you laid out that people who have come before us, like Marsha P. Johnson, like Harriet Tubman, would look at anything that we complain about today and say, ciao. (laughs) and literally keep it rolling. And so we do have their example and their example is hope and persistence and fearlessness. Exactly. And if we can hold on to those three things, we're going to make it through this. I think that's exactly right, Amara. 
Thank you so much for joining us. And we now understand why you host such an amazing podcast and why people read what you write about race and politics and social justice. Jamila, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Mara. It's a pleasure. That was Jamila King, race and justice reporter at Mother Jones and host of the Mother Jones podcast. And now it's time for Transform, the part of our show where we elevate change makers in our community who innovate and create a better world for us all. Transform takes us into their world. Today, I am nerding out and totally excited to talk about Star Trek and trans representation with Ian Alexander. Ian plays Grey the first ever trans character in the history of the Star Trek franchise, Grey will debut in this season's Star Trek Discovery, which will premiere on October 15th. That program will also introduce a non-binary character. However, pushing the bounds of Final Frontiers is not new to Ian. Known for his role on the Netflix series OA, he's also the first out transgender Asian American to act on television. As a Trekkie, I can recite, you know, space the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. It is a true joy (laughs) to be talking uh, to you right now, Ian. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Amara. I am so, so excited. It makes me so happy that you're a huge fan of Star Trek. I personally am still learning so much about the universe. I am like working my way through Discovery right now. But yeah, I can't wait to bring authentic trans representation to the Star Trek universe. I know there has been some allusion to gender nonconforming in past characters, especially involving the Trill. Um, but I'm excited for it to be like explicit trans actor playing a out trans character in the universe. I mean, I think, you know, it's far beyond time. And I think what's so exciting and why people are so excited is because how can there be a future without us? And that imagining ourselves in the future is so key to the vitality of our community. And so being in a show that is about the future of the future, I think it's it's really, really a powerful moment for our community. And I know that's why we're so excited. I absolutely agree. Like, I can't wait to see this future where we've all sort of transcended and ascended gender. I mean, that's that's my goal personally. <laughs> and I, I, I like sort of looking forward to this future in Star Trek where a thousand years from now, gender is not necessarily something that uh, people need to discuss. Like there's just a openly trans character that exists and it's not necessarily a huge deal. And I'm so, so excited. I can't really dive in too much about the character without getting to spoiler territory, but there's just so many exciting things that Grey and uh, Adira, the first non-binary character in the Star Trek mm-hmm. universe, uh, is going to bring to the table. So I can't wait for you to see it. Uh, go ahead, make news. Tell, you know, give us a spoiler. I'm, I'm happy to do that at any point. <laughs> on this issue of the future and playing someone in the future and the fact that you've been on you know, a sci-fi inspired series on Netflix. I'm wondering when you were a kid, you know, seven or eight, could you imagine what you're doing now? I mean, it's really fascinating that in the future of that person who was seven or eight, you are playing a person in the future. Uh, So I'm wondering what your imaginations were as a child around where you were headed and what was possible. I never would have pictured anything like what I'm doing right now. I mean, I I always had dreams and aspirations of becoming an actor or just being someone that like made an an influence in the world. And I've always wanted to help people. So that was always my main goal. I had no clue that I would get the opportunities that I've had. And I am so grateful that with the OA, I was able to bring an Asian American transgender teen onto the screen and into mainstream for so many people like myself who had been invisible. I don't remember seeing any 
trans characters or even like gender non-conforming characters unless they were villains when I was younger. I really can't think of anyone that was like a positive role model for me that made me feel truly seen and affirmed in my gender. And it wasn't until I started acting on the OA that I started seeing other roles um, like Elliot Fletcher's character on Shameless where I was like, okay, like I can see now there are more opportunities for transmasculine people. Things are opening up even more now with um, Leo Shang's character on The L Word and, you know, there's um, Garcia in Tales of the City on Netflix. And yeah, there's so many amazing non-binary transmasculine actors out there. But yeah, I, I never could have imagined there would be a whole world of acting and voice acting and being on a video game, um, The Last of Us Part Two that I was on. Like I never could have imagined I would be immersed in so many different amazing um, sci-fi fantasy fiction worlds. Yeah. And I think what's so amazing about what you're describing is how sometimes even for quote mainstream actors, and I guess that's a code word for white straight actors, there's this idea that in order to fulfill or embody your role that you have to totally separate yourself from the character and that that's somehow true acting, that transforming. And I think that what's really interesting about what you're describing is that what can be powerful about us in fulfilling our roles, even as artists or creators, is actually being able to bring a part of our experiences to these roles, to be able to bring um, what we've been through and how we perceive the world into our work. Absolutely. I mean, I have definitely gone on quite a few rants about this. Um, but they, I mean, it's it's so important to have authentic representation, especially when it comes to trans actors playing trans characters. As an actor, I mean, there is an element of assuming a role and, you know, doing the character work and really studying and discovering how to portray this new person. But there also is an element of bringing your own experience to the table and so much of it is drawing from your own experiences, at least in my method of acting. Like I am drawing from my own past and history and feelings that I've had before, situations I've been in before. And so I wouldn't be able to do that and really tell a true, authentic story of a, of a trans person without having that lived experience myself. And so I really just sort of bring that to the table when I'm acting. It's not a choice that I'm making. It's not a costume that I'm putting on. Like at the end of the day, I still am that person. So it's very authentic and genuine in a way that I just don't believe a cis actor could get to that level of like authenticity with being trans and like what it's like to be trans and exist in a world that is not made for people that don't conform to the gender binary of, you know, you are assigned this gender at birth and then you must remain that gender at birth. Anyone who breaks out of that binary is rebelling, essentially. Um, and so I, I think that that's something to be extremely proud of. On that issue, what do you say to directors, I mean, if you could say to directors or to showrunners about this specific issue about representation and this idea that well, one of the reasons why we have to cast broadly in quotes for trans characters or people who are gender nonconforming or non-binary is because we can't find, you know, that those actors just don't exist. And therefore we have to cast this wide net. When you hear that, what do you think and feel? What crosses your mind? When, you know, I hear casting directors or directors say, oh, well, there's, there's no one out there for this part. We just have to pull from who we have. I would point them to the story of my own like experience coming into acting, which was I had no professional experience. I didn't even have an agent or a manager. And the creators of the OA, Britt Marling and Zal Butt they both really, really, really wanted to bring a transgender actor to play the 14 to 15 year old Asian American character that they had written. And the casting directors told them, you know, you're not going to be able to find someone who is 14 or 15, also Asian American, also transgender male. Like, it's just not going to happen. They were like, well, let's just see. Like, let's put out the open casting call. Let's see what happens. And they took that leap of faith and then they found me. And so it's possible. It very much is possible to just sort of put an open casting call out there and to find someone who may not have made a name for themselves yet in the industry, but they still are just as talented and just as qualified for the job. 
I mean, I would point them to Hunter Schaefer on Euphoria. Like, I don't believe that Hunter had any prior acting experience, at least to my knowledge, I don't think she did prior to Euphoria. And now she's like hugely influential among among like Gen Z. And I would say that she's like one of the it girls, honestly, um, like someone who so many teenagers look up to and admire. And so just because someone isn't already uh, popular and well-known doesn't mean that they can't be if given the opportunity. There's Erin Phillip as well. I mean, she literally built up her platform just online completely by herself, wasn't signed as a model. She just kept manifesting and putting out into the universe like, one day I'm going to be a supermodel. And look where she's at now. She's a supermodel. Like, she did that. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it's also the power of owning our own images and our own stories and asserting them before we're necessarily seen by the larger society. Um, This idea, again, of making sure that we control our images, control our stories, and understand that that is enough, um, which I think is really powerful. Speaking of bringing all of yourself to your roles, one of the things that is true about you is that in addition to being an actor, you are also very much an activist, someone who cares about our community and where we are in society. And four years ago, you were involved in a very famous response to students trying to police and prevent trans students from using bathrooms at UCLA and just to sort of erase us in that way. And I'm wondering if you can just talk about um, how you're feeling right now about where we are on trans rights and uh, trans acceptance. I am so glad that you brought that post up because so much has changed in those last four years since I made that response. For context, there was this like image of UCLA students protesting trans people being allowed to choose whichever bathroom they wanted to. And, you know, they had some very like transphobic hate rhetoric that was like, oh, you know, we're not going to be safe in bathrooms, like use the bathroom that you're genitals are assigned to or you know something yeah. along those lines Keep your transgenderism out of our bathrooms yes exactly yeah just that bs and i just was so fed up very angry just pissed off honestly at being told like that i wasn't a human being that i just wrote a sign that said shut the fuck up yeah. <laughs> i just i mean it, it it was a viral mm-hmm. post so today i would say we still have so much more to go Trump has actively been trying to roll back protections for LGBT people, especially trans people. And so I would love to see trans people in the state Senate or even in the U.S. Senate making these decisions. I honestly would say most of the important work has to come from everyone, not just trans people advocating for our rights. It's all hands on deck sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, use that terminology. You'll be using it on the ship if that's where your character ends up (laughs) Um, on Discovery. I think that that's right. And I think that for us to have the future that we want, all of these things have to happen in the present with regards to creating more space for us in society. So all of the things that you said are so on point. I'm wondering what you hope we look back and take from the presence of your character and what you're going to bring to Gray. Wow, that's a great question. I would say that the main thing that I want people to take away from Gray's character is that there can be someone that exists like myself, someone who is trans masculine and non binary and trans. We can exist and we can succeed and thrive and be happy and supported in any environment. And there's a sense of unity and family especially with the people that Gray comes into contact with, like his sort of partner in crime, Adira. And when he meets Colbert and Stamets, it's just a loving, supportive environment, which everyone deserves. And I think that's just the main message I would want people to take away is that everyone deserves that safe space to just express themselves freely and be who they are, regardless of what gender they are. And also that someone can be trans and it doesn't have to necessarily be the defining point of their character like they can still have a personality outside of just their identity or they can have a story outside of their gender and i think that's really important for other trans actors as well to have opportunities where their storyline might not necessarily revolve around the character's journey 
through their transition or coming out as trans because trans people have such rich, diversified, lived experiences. We all, yes, we all are so proud of being trans, but also there's so much more to us as well. Well, Ian, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, You have made history. You are making history. And there will be so much more history that you will make, undoubtedly, as you're still at the very beginning of your career. I'm so thrilled that you could join us today. And also, I'm just wondering if at some point, just tell Sonequa Martin-Green that I said hello. Okay. (laughs) I definitely can too. I will recommend my podcast to her and like maybe the rest of the Trek family. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, she doesn't know who I am. (laughs) She will soon. But truly, it's fantastic to have you on today. And as I say, this this is just the beginning, and it's so exciting to see. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been such a pleasure, Mara. I am so grateful and so excited for you to be able to see Star Trek Discovery Season 3 and meet Grey. Absolutely. That was Ian Alexander, who will play the character of Grey on the upcoming season of Star Trek Discovery. Grey will be the first ever trans character in the history of the Star Trek franchise. Star Trek Discovery premieres on October 15th. Thank you for joining us on the Translash podcast. Don't forget to listen all the way through to the end of the show for something extra. I'm Amara Jones. If you like what you heard, please go to Apple Podcasts to rate and review us. Also, you can listen to Translash on Spotify and wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on the web at translash.org to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Translash Media. Like us on Facebook and tell your friends. Translash Podcast is produced by Translash Media by Futuro Studios. The Translash team includes Ruby Flozinski, Oliver Ash Klein, Montana Thomas, and Yannick Ikimirko. The Futuro Studios team includes Nicole Rothwell, Jess Alvarenga, Stephanie LeBeau, Leah Shaw, Julia Caruso, and Sophie Davis. Our digital strategy is handled by Daniela Capistrano with support from Sean Watkins. The music you heard was composed by Ben Draghi and also courtesy of ZZK Records. Okay, Translash fam, what I'm looking forward to over the next couple of weeks is the launch of my new website, amarajones.com. Now, I had an old website and it was actually a Tumblr page that we converted to make look like a website. So now that just doesn't work anymore for so many different reasons. So we have a bona fide website where you will be able to dig deeper into all of the content that I produce, not only with Translash, but across the board, and sign up for an upcoming Amara Jones newsletter. So go to amarajones.com, check out all the stuff, all my new pretty pictures, and um, also sign up for my newsletter.